Hello friends. Welcome you all to the 34th session of Home-Based Development. In this lecture, we are going to see some more protocols. This is a uh, little different from the peripherals. This is for interconnecting different modules with a controller on the ARM side. Okay. So you will see in any embedded system an I squared C and spy protocol being used there as a a bus. So let us have a, a brief introduction about this. And then of course this is a universal synchronous asynchronous receiver transmitter. This is a, a serial controller, serial port controller then and then we will see the general purpose IO as a, to complete our discussion on peripheral. Okay. This we have covered a few portions of peripheral we saw in the last lecture and then this is the continuation of that and with this we will be completing the, the both the categories of peripherals and interfaces that that will be used in an okay. It would be used for any other any other resource too. So we are particular about what is being used in the person the wrong way. Okay. So what is I square C? It is an inter integrated circuit bus. So you can see that it is better than two IC is better than two IC when you it is not like a bus within the SOC. Okay. Then it is it is AHB is an example where different modules in the SOC get connected to the bus. As the name implies inter integrated that is between two ICs physically there are two ICs in the system and then it is connected to an I square C bus ok. So, there will be some pins here there will be some pins here and then they they are connected to an I square C. So, there are physical cables and number of uh, lines in the cable and then what is the kind of protocol that needs to be run on both the side of the ICs ok. What kind of signals need to be sent over this line what is the amplitude and what is the frequency ok and then what is the format you know if it is a packet what is the data format where is the how suppose an HKC bus could be used to connect multiple ICs. So, we may have to address one of the ICs in the bus so that one of them respond back ok. This kind of various things come similar to maybe you know in a between a, in a network scenario where we have LAN cables and then some switches coming and then we have no other computers in another network. So, these connect multiple computers and switches using switches multiple computers are connected to a network. So, what we are seeing is a I space C is a multiple ICs in a PCB or maybe multiple PCBs you know with the very short distances they are connected multiple ICs in a single PCB or multiple PCB they are connected and they also form a kind of you know multiple devices can be there on the chip on the bus and then they communicate with each other. So, it is like since these two ends of the thing you know one can transmit and the other can receive and similarly the other other device can transmit the, the other you know two end points are there. So, E 1 end, end point E 1 and E 2 E 1 can come you know transmit something E which E 2 will accept and E 2 will transmit and E 1 will accept. So, this is the kind of communication that we are going to talk when we talk about XPC this is what we mean. So, an inter IC bus is often used to communicate across the circuit board distances. It is a simple low bandwidth short distance protocol. It provides good support for communication with various low on board peripheral devices that are accessed intermittently. So, the I space C bus is not kind of a like, a, like an AHU bus where the communication happens continuously. This is very, very you know slow devices. So, once in a while they communicate. So, this is meant for a and low bandwidth, low the data rate is low as well as the frequency of communication is 
low as well as the amount of data communication or communicated over this bus is also less. Most available HPC devices operate at speed of 400 kb. Okay, this is much lower than the NDPS and GDPS band, bandwidth that we see in the bus. So, some venturing up into low megahertz, okay, maybe maximum is megahertz. So, I say C is easy to use to link multiple devices together since it has big built in addressing scheme. Okay, so that device coming up, okay, it is like uh, multiple computers are connected to the LAN network. So, each computer with a network card in it or network uh, port in it, it will have its own MAC address. As you all of you know, if you connect MAC address, it will need to a particular uh, device which is in the LAN network, LAN or Ethernet. Okay. So, similar to the any device connected to I2C bus, they have their own unique ID. Okay. That means you can differentiate. It is like a plug and play. So, any device can be connected to ICSC and then they can still be there without caching with the addresses of other devices. See, that is very important when we want multiple devices to coexist in the bus because we want to uniquely address them. Any device wants to communicate with any other device in the network, they need to have a unique address on the network, otherwise, they will not be able to communicate. Right? So, in the ICSC bus, what happens is the devices will have its own unique. Built in addressing scheme. So, if they have their own addresses, which can be used uh, to differentiate between multiple devices in the bus. So, these are all multiple devices, peripheral devices. This is kind of a central microcontroller in our head, it is on. So, there are only two lines SBA and SBA. Let us see what it is. These are two wire serial bus. This is serial bus. What is serial bus? Okay. So, when you have a data bus of no 8 bit wide bus D0 to D7 data goes. So, this is a parallel bus because all the particular clock the data on different buses with different lines physical lines constitute one data correct. So, this is a parallel configuration parallel bus. So, whereas in serial bus the data is flown in terms of time. One bit at a time, so it goes in the sequence. So you may configure, you know, you may say that at the physical level, a zero volt, oh sorry, zero volt here, and then maybe you know, five volt here constitutes a zero level and one, or it could be that it is like this. So it is plus five volts and minus five volts, or minus two volts, or whatever, okay, or minus twelve volts. So, this kind of a voltage levels may be there, but it is in C, C you know it is a serial device that means what one bit at a time is sent over time. So, if you want to send a 8 bit data you have to have 8 clock cycles ok. If I consider this one bit transfer rate as you know maybe a tau it takes tau seconds per mill you know uh, per bit then it will take 8 tau for sending one particular byte of data over the bus because it is sent over a serial bus. So, this is the kind of serial bus there are no multiple lines coming the data goes like this one or two right and the first one may be MSB or LSB based on the path protocol it has to be interpreted according to the protocol. So, the two I suppose signals are serial data and serial clock. So, you can make out from the name itself one is the data bits are going and the other one is to see when we have a data in a serial bus the problem is suppose you have a data like this, this is the 8 bit data, but this is the values. Now, what happens the serial bus will look like maybe if I say minus is the minus 5 volts is this and then this. So, there is no change at all in the data for 4 clocks, 4 pulses, and then another 4 it remains as 1. Now, unless there is some sense of timing, whether this is divided into 4 bits or is it divided into 8 bits, the receiver will not be able to comprehend whether it is consecutive 4 zeros have come or consecutive 2 zeros have come because if it is calculated only this one, then maybe 2 zeros. So, there should be a sense of clock, the clock needs to be there to say whether how many bits are to be 
know what is the width of a particular transmission of a bit on the bus okay in terms of time then if it is longer for four you know suppose tau is a time then you know four into tau four of period it has been zero so it will be considered as a three four zeros have come I and mean then four ones have come so one complete data has come. so it has to be interpreted this way unless there is a sense of time it is impossible to find out what is going on the bus so somebody who is sampling the serial uh, uh, port uh, the, the particular line the receiver needs to know what is the clock so that is why a clock is connected and uh, data is also coming so data will be interpreted between the clock duration the middle portion whatever is the value whether it is 0 or 1 according to the level sampled maybe it will sample not only one with two samples it will take and then how it out and find out what is the value because due to noise fluctuation there may be some defects it needs to be taken care of and then finally it decides that okay whether it is 0, 0 or 1. So, that is how the serial data is sampled and then given. in. So, this is not suppose serial transmission of 8 bit bytes of data or 7 bit device addresses and control. So, now since I told that multiple devices are connected and they each device has its own address assuming that there are 7 bit addresses ok then you can know that how many you know, 128 devices can be connected. So, 7 bit address is there unique address ok each of them. In this case any data sent needs to be maybe appended with a, a particular address so which is meant for which device and then the data comes calls. So, it is a serial device maybe with respect to time uh, ok if I am drawing like this uh, you know time 0 is here. So, first address comes and then maybe data or I may have to draw it in a different way. So, in time wise this first address is given and then maybe it depends on the protocol what is being followed uh, you know uh, normally a header will come first and then the data okay, in any protocol uh, networking protocol. So, and then control base you know what to do with that particular bit is there anything has to be then along with the particular data and there some more you no know, information like start bit or start bit which I am talk about. So, the device that initiates the transaction on I should be this term as a master. So, please remember the communication can be this way or it could be this way. So, whoever is initiating the transfer that is called the master. So, they can communicate with each other ok on the bus. So, the protocol should support that. So, master normally controls the clock signal. So, since master is generating the signal ok. The sender has to control the clock signal because that sender only knows what is the data and how much of uh, baud rate it is sending. So, it has to inform the play device also uh, and then the clock rate will be clock also will be generated by the master and then master sends the data also. So, both should be in you know should be synchronous so that the slave device whichever is receiving the data can sample it according to the clock and whatever is the data at that moment 0 or 1 it will be interpreted ok. The device being addressed by the master is called a slave fine. So, how is it communicated there is a yes start by master ok. If it is started by master then the value will be 1 or 0. So, if it is slave uh, and then no no uh, it is like a read and write by master ok. Whether See, it's always started by a master and then says that whether it has to be read, written or read. So, if if it is reading, that means the slave has to send the data. The master will read it. Okay. Uh, if master is writing, then it is sending the data. So, this will be initiated by the master, but it will say that which slave device it is communicating with, and then who is supposed to write. So, it could be a a read access or a write access. The, you know, the master is trying to access the slave, either to write into it or read it from it. So it will be starting with this particular address, which the device it is trying to interact with, and then whether it is a read or an a write. So this is the LSB and this is the MSB. So it is a with the time MSB comes first. Okay, with the time this data goes in the serial bus. So, where does this go? It goes into the SDA whatever serial data ok. The SCL is a clock which is separately running you know which is in synchronous with the particular bit you know, speed with which the data is going. And then the 
data may be sending sent by either a slave device or or a master device depends on whether read or write was performed. So during the data transmission, an act bit also sent by the receiver. Okay, for every data. Okay, and then finally a stop is sent by master, and then the communication stops. So it could be like it can initiate one transfer, and then multiple transfers can happen, and then a stop happens. So it could be for the multiple reads or multiple writes between the master and state. This is what happens. Okay. So the master begins the communication by issuing the start condition. The nine bit pattern is repeated if more bytes need to be transmitted. So this particular nine bit, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, data, and then one please as one is okay. So so first of all, this technology is combined with this data because. Slave has to acknowledge that it has received this address, and then I think we have to con compute it like this. So this constitutes the nine bit. So it is starting with this, and then it acknowledges. Okay. Um, it, okay. And then the next of the thing, and then finally the stop bit is sent by the master to stop the communication. You know, the number of bytes transferred is controlled by the master. Okay. Similar to any other byte uh, bus transfer. So I squared C functioning and I squared C state can hold off the master in the middle of a transaction using what's called clock stretching. So what happens is, you know, if the device slave device is slow, not able to consume at the far rate the master is pumping the data, it can it can forcibly make the clock low. It does know when it see <coughs> there is a signal, correct? This A C L or S B A, right? This is the data bus, and this is the data simple line, and this is the clock line. It is connected to both the slave as well as the master. Okay, both master and slave are connected to both of them, both the lines. Okay, maybe I will make it dark. So you see that the both the lines are connected to both master and slave. Now master is driving the clock. No problem. Let it drive. It wants to, but when it is in the low, if the slave holds it low for continuous for some more time, the master even if it tries to drive it, it will not be able to drive it to high because it's already pulling it to low. So it is all connected to the same line. So this is the some kind of a communication back to the master saying that it's a you no know, slow control. So to say that slow down your data, okay, I'm not able to consume it the way speed with which you are sending. So it will do a clock stretching. To slow down the data transmitted over the bus, slave keeps SCL pulled low until it's ready to continue. Okay, so SCL protocol supports multiple masters, of course, the, but most system designers include only one master. So normally, there can be multiple masters. As I told you, slaves can be many, master can be one or more. But it says that a designer may decide to have only one master. Then the communication between any device. Between master and slave can happen, and both can say, you know, read from or write from, but it is initiated always from master, and the clock is also initiated from master. Okay, whoever is sending the data. Okay, so there may be one or more slaves on the bus. Both masters and slaves can receive and transmit data. Right? Each I squared C compatible hardware slave device comes with a predefined device address. I told you, any device connected to a bus needs to have a unique address. Otherwise, you will not be able to communicate with the device. So when it is manufactured, there it comes with a unique address, and then the lower bit of it may be configured at the board level. See what happens is maybe I get an IP from one company. They will have some slave device address. It is not like match where it can be unique. Okay, 48 bit address is there, and then we can read on that case. No address could be unique, but here it may not be unique. So what happens is at the board level, you know what we need is Between the board or maybe multiple board, if you are communicating with the devices which are there, should be unique. We are not bothered if suppose another device in a different board has the same device ID as what is there in this. So this is not going to be communicating with this device at any cost. So no problem. As long as the devices which are connected to the I squared C B, I squared I squared C bus, in a single board or multiple boards which are connected to each other, as long as they are having unique addresses, we don't mind. 
you know the same device addresses in the other board. So that's why what is done is the higher bits are configured by the manufacturer maybe, and then the lower bits can be configured by the board developer. So then you can get an unique address for each of the devices in a particular board. So SPC interface is a bus interface serves as an interface between a microcontroller and the serial IC bus. So the interface is a you know between the ARM okay ARM SOC. So I said it is between the chips right. So inter IC. So there should be a controller within the chip. It should be inside the chip and then it will drive on the bus I said see there is D A and S B L bit you know a pins will come out. A CL and then they will be driven by this controller, which will take care of, which will understand the protocol. So it could be called as a quite physical layer level. What it has to drive, what moments of current, and uh, you know what are the addresses. Like so I said, the master features are clock generation. The master has to generate the clock and start and stop stop generation because start signal and stop signal only indicates that the say that the data. Transmitted is number of bytes transmitted. How much has to be sent is controlled by the master. So master sends the clock as well as the start signal and stop signal. Okay. So very simple handshake and easy to understand. So slave features are programmable I C S T address detection. So when a particular master is driving the, you know, sending a particular device address, the device should have slave device should be able to. Sample it and then find out whether it has been addressed. So that detection, address detection, whether this address which is coming on the bus is same as its own address. That has to be that intelligence should be there. And then that could be a dual addressing capability. That means uh, now the same device can have multiple same device addresses. So it will behave like a merely you no know, different functionalities. So each uh, device address may be different. So two slave addresses to the same particular device. And then stop bit detection. It should direct a stop bit so that you no, know, it it will know that the end of transmission has happened. And you know, for even a byte transfer or a bus transfer, uh, sorry, a bus transfer. So that's all. Now we say this will be originally developed by IEEE for communication between devices. Interesting that. Then example of simple I/O computer is called EEPROM thermal sensors and data type block. They are connected. Especially EEPROM contains parameters needed to correctly configure a memory controller. So Memory controller is there, okay. Memory controller, and then it is connected through I/O bus to E. So where you can put some information here, which can be programmed also electronically erasable from. So based on data, what is you know written into it, on power on, it can configure the memory controller so that how external memory devices can or uh, you know. Uh, Internal MM, you know, uh, memory, main memory. How the memory is sort to be configured? That can be that parameters can be put in E from because we need to store those values in the from permanent storage. So it can't be part of the memory just because we want to keep some configurable parameters. We don't want to keep the whole memory or memory controller. Uh, we cannot do that. So we are providing a small E from which will also be mapped onto some address. Okay, it will be a It is. It is not connected to ARM actually. It is only on the I2C bus. Okay. So if ARM wants to communicate, it has to communicate through the I2C bus. Okay. Because it has got only interface with the I2C. So normally, what happens is on power on, this will come up and then it may configure the memory controller, uh, or it could be controlled by the power program also, the ARM. And we can change the configuration also based on whatever we have. So I said these are used for control interfaces, particular processing devices that have separate application specific data interfaces. So we can have some interfaces to signal processing devices, so specific devices, a third party devices which have I said the interface that can be connected. For instance, this is commonly used in multimedia applications where typical devices include RF tuners or video decoders, mostly some audio or analog devices. No, um, it's not a company name I am referring to. Uh, any of the, you know. Devices like this, which you know, which generates analog signals, I would say, then um, they can be connected through I/O bus. The um, okay, so we saw one kind of a bus. Now let us see another uh, standard bus that you may come across. It's a serial peripheral interface bus. It's called SPA. And let me give you some brief introduction. SPA allows half or full duplex 
then this is an option you can select a play with it. So, multiple again similarly to spy bus and SKC bus, so, multiple play devices there may be there, and then you can select it through an NFS signal. A specific play device can be S1, S2, play device can be selected by a master to communicate. So, NFS has a six select to let the spy master communicate with this player individually and to avoid contention on the data line. So, they can communicate over that. So, see here. This is the clock driven by the master, and then the bar indicator here actually decides the clock duty cycle. Okay, what is the time frequency of this clock? And then data coming in or going out has to be parallel data. Is the parallel buffer parallel data is communicated, you know, translated into serial data. It has to be transmitted. Okay, CX buffer is a transmit buffer. So, it depends on so it is a master because you know clock is going out. So, this is a master. So, master out is MOSI, right. So, this is the out. So, this transfer buffer comes here and then filter it out. So, if it is LSB first, then LSB data goes out, or you can consider it such a way that MSB goes out, then this will be done in another way. So, this data goes out. Similarly, the data can also be received by this and then it will be coming into the receive buffer and then goes out ok. It, uh, it will be received by this case. So, there will be a, a logic here you know we will be configuring using the memory map drive or maybe you know it is depends on how it is connected um, and then they will be configured using these registers what is the bar rate and whether it is an input or output and then whether LSB first or MSB first all these are all uh, you know different controls will be there which will be um, configured then the communication happens with the other device this is the simple um, this, this is a device select will be happening with me. So, that is about spy interface now let us see what is the USAR. Okay, universal synchronous or synchronous receiver transmitter. It offers a flexible means of full duplex data exchange. So, U short is always a full duplex. So, there is a one pin TXT RSB and then they will be communicating simultaneously. So, you may have used serial port R232 in your earlier um, classes. So, it communicates over a serial bus and then you know ground will be there TXD. Okay, it will be connected to RXD, and then each CXD is connected to R. So it is like a cross. Okay, and if you remember the number okay, seven and two and three, so this is fine. Um, from this required to know because this, this could be on a different voltage source. Okay, and then this device could be on another voltage source. So if they want to understand the signal which is being you know normally it is determined as 12 volts or 15 volts. So, we need to have a common ground. So, there should be a ground connection also normally between them ok. So, it follows an industry standard non no is non returning to 0 that means no it will the signal 0 or 1 is represented by minus value minus 12 volts and plus 12 volts is what is being normally followed ok. So, if the signal is never 0 ok even for a 0 communication you know for a uh, suppose continuously if you are writing a 0 what happens it will all be minus 12 volts. So, the volt the signal on the line will have some value ok it is not like you have 0 to 5 volts then if you are sending all 0 volts there, there will not be anything on the line no what is will be sensed on the line. So, you will not know whether yeah, all zeros are coming or maybe uh, nothing is connected. So, the receiver could get confused with that particular state of voltage level on the bus. So, non return to 0 make sure that there is always a, a some voltage level either positive or negative on the line. So, that the receiver could sense it and then find out whether if it is 0 it means nothing is connected. If it is a plus 1 plus 12 it is a positive bits are being positive. 
or if it is totally all negative maybe all zeros are being called. So, with a V is equal then fit this is that. So, it is also synchronous one way communication and half duplex single way communication transmitter clock output for synchronous asynchronous no? transmission. If you want a synchronous transmission it is asynchronous actually it can be asynchronous because that is why the name is the transmission could be asynchronous or synchronous. If you want a synchronous mode then there should be a clock. Transmitters should also send a clock. High speed data communication is possible by using a DMA. Okay. So, it is also DMA can be interfaced. Programmable data bits are 8 or 9 in the two. Configurable stop bits are 1 or 2 stop bits. So, what is the start and stop bits? So, you know, just to give you some overview. So, this is the time. So, this is the start bit. Okay, normally you know it starts with some start bit and then data bits are designed and then on stop bit will be the top bit can be one or two bits bit, right. So, it can be configured. So, totally you can see that for a 8 bit data, okay, 8 bit or 9 bit data, uh, this is one extra bit we are adding and then assuming that two bits are added as a top bit, then we are actually sending 11 bits for transmitting 8 bit of bits of data, okay. So, this is the kind of worst case scenario. Okay, go ahead. So, features are separate enable bits for transmitter and receiver. You can enable them separately. You okay. can enable only one of them or both of them. It can detect the receiver buffer pool. See, one buff, uh, one byte is received, then it will send an interrupt because it is coming as a serial data, right? So, it has to wait for a complete byte has to be byte to be received, and it could be in terms of milliseconds. It may take milliseconds of time, just in the bar right anyway. But no processor is working in nanoseconds or microseconds. So, it needs to wait for that particular uh, you know 8 byte no uh, 1 byte is received and then it will interrupt the processor to copy it from there. So, that next to word can be next byte can be received from the serial code or a serial line. So, transmit buffer empty when a particular transmission is done. So, what happens is processor writes the byte and then initiates the transmission. And then it does not wait for the transmission to get over because it is sending it in serial code, you know, one by one, one bit at a time. It will take a lot of time for that to be a, even, a, you know, one byte of transfer data to be transmitted. It will take few milliseconds by the time, you know, uh, thousands of cycles of instructions can be executed by the processor. So, processor does not wait for transmission to complete. Transmission will be done, and then once the all eight or you no know, start and stop is will be, you know, 11 bits or 10. Then the user use of peripheral, you know, interrupts the processor so that next word, next byte can be written in. So, this is how the serial code works. The end of transmission flag, so I know you can check this flag. Parity control can be given, no R parity or even parity. So, what happens is if it is an R parity, uh, suppose you no, know, you have 8 bit of data, okay, and then uh, parity bit can be added to it. So, parity can be odd bit, okay, option. Or even what uh, what happens is today so if suppose you are configuring it for odd bit, eight bit of data, okay, they, it could take uh, any value zero or one or something, okay, some eight bit data, and then one more stop parity bit is added to it, okay. Totally, suppose you use eight bit data, one more bit of parity is added, and if it is configured for odd bit. Or number of ones are to be there. Suppose if in the given data you have only two ones, you know, rest of it is of zero, then it will put one here so that effectively the nine bits are odd. If you configure it for odd parity, if it is for even parity, it will be very good. So if it is only two ones, it will put zero as a parity, or if it is a odd number of ones are there, it will put a one more one so that it will be even. So what happens is on the receiving side, if the received parity including the parity bit if if it is set for odd parity suppose ok and then the receiver this is receiver and this is transmitter transmitter has taken care of sending 8 or uh, sorry odd number of ones in the transmitted data including data and parity bit. If on receiving side if it receives as an even number of ones that means there is an error that is one bit error has happened. It can detect one bit error, but multiple bit error it cannot detect. But it is a kind of error detection mechanism. It cannot correct the error because suppose one bit has changed from R to even 1 to 0 or 0 to 1, you do not know which bit is corrected. So, it is not possible to correct this error with correction 
data correction is not possible, but data error detection is possible because you will receive odd priority set. So, both transmitter and receiver should be aligned on it, what priority it is going to communicate with. And then, if it receives something different, then you will know that there is an error so that it can ask the transmitter to send the data back. So, that kind of a priority checks can be done. Multiprocess communication enter into new mode if address match does not occur. So, if multiple processes are communicating over period board, okay, then one of them should be in use, okay, because all only one communication can happen here, multiple transmissions cannot happen. So, all other devices can be mute so that two devices, any two active devices can communicate with each other. So, this is a very complex birth, you know, talk diagram. I do not know where you can see it uh, from far west distances. So, basically, TX and RX. And then we have a transmitter buffer similar to what we saw in the spy. So, no shift register is there, and then the bits are shifted out. Similarly, received data comes here, and then it is collected and then sent out data register. Okay, we have to wait for all the data to be received that before sending to the data register, which will be you no know, on a uh, APB bus. Okay. And then the bar rate, you know, what is the uh, speed with which the bar rate needs to be aligned between the two devices, okay. There is no clock between this in asynchronous mode. So, if there is in the absence of clock, we have to have some means of pre, you know, before communicating, it should be aligned, okay. This is what is going to be my bar rate, that means the receiver should interpret that 0 or 1 will take this much of time in terms of second ok so whatever, whatever millisecond in terms of time how much is that I you know bit width so that it can wait for that long to receive all the 8 bits or 9 bits of data which is being sent. So, that bar rate generation is one logic which is being actually done in this block. So, there should be a clock and then you have to preload the value and then accordingly it will you know send out the particular bit in a particular speed. So, that can be controlled using this and then if it has to be a synchronous mode suppose you want to communicate through synchronous mode then the clock will be driven by this circuitry which is connected to the other end of the device. So, the sampling and then clock rate bar rate generation is here and then interrupt can be configured using these registers. So, you can say transmit enable, receive enable and then you know uh, on complete uh, transmit buffer MP interrupt has to be generated or not, all these things can be done using this part of the security. So, this is an high level overview of what is inside a and in user talk, ok. Then the last topic general purpose IO. So, this is very simple DPO is a generic pin on an integrated circuit whose behavior, including whether it is an input or output pin, can be controlled by the user at a run time. So, GPO pins have no special purpose defined and go unused by default. So, you what happens in normally in a, a, a chip ok, the GPO pins come out ok. So, it will be called as 0 to you no know, P0 port 0 to port 0 bit 1 ok to 7 and then there will be another port P1 ok sorry uh, P1 P1 port also uh, will have 0 to P1 7. So, different pins are coming out this is actually individually can be con 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 considered as an input or an output. So, it can drive some signal or maybe you can connect to this LED then you can blink this ok. There is in the simulator there are some practice examples you can try it out. Um, so, this kind of a, a different based on the, uh, the requirement of the system these pins can be configured. So, maybe in some particular system you need only to input process lots of input. So, all the pins provided can be configured as input, but there may be possibility that you have only you want two outputs to come out of the chip which needs to be controlled and you know, maybe external circuitry and the rest of it as input. So, anything can be configured. So, the GPIO is the meant for such a kind of a support. So, we do not want to you know freeze the number of input ports and output ports in the IC manufacturing itself. It is left to the programmer to configure it that is the purpose of this general purpose IO. So, it does not associate it does not come with some associated signal or something it is just a free port it can be configured as an input or output. It is helpful to have handful of additional digital control lines that can be configured 
as input or output having these available from chip. So, having these available sorry for interruption. So, <coughs> so here in this available from chip can save the hassle having to arrange additional security to provide them, <coughs> which is part of a chip. It can be done in software. So, features details which can be configured to be input or output. I told you that it can be disabled, you know, selective, enabled or disabled. Uh, it could be input values are readable ok you can in fact in the true software you can read a particular value you know suppose you are configured as an input unless you are able to read whether 0 or 1 is there on the particular input line then there is no point in configuring it right. So, the input can be read either 0 or 1 output values can be writable you can write a particular 0 or 1 into a particular thing and it will be dialed out a signal. So, it is very 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 required for any input application. Input values can often be used as an IRQ. Maybe you know uh, we can drive the IRQ fields also, typically for wake up. Email. So, some GPIOs have 5 volts tolerant input, ok. So, some chips are you know low voltage chips, they, even though they are operating at 2 volts, the GPIO pin levels are 5 volt levels. So, they are like a ADC, I told you, there is different V reference is there, which is a totally different from the supply voltage to the IC. Even the GPIOs also have separate voltage which is much more than what is uh, the operating voltage of the IP. So, this is very helpful for a embedded applications where you want to interface this with some other device. So, use case scenarios to detect button trust on the trust system to receive interrupt request from different devices or it could be this all for uh, if you are if you want to receive some interest, if you want to send out some output, it can be to build LED or even buzzer. How do you sound the buzzer? Because if you can change the frequency of this particular pulses going out on a pin, though you can only send 0 or 1, but the processor is running at a much higher rate. Okay, please remember that it is in megahertz or gigahertz range. So, you can actually configure this pulses going out so that you can connect to the buzzer and then you can create no buzzer sound you maybe change the frequency of this to generate different sounds alarm or anything you can be you can generate using this just GPIO output. So, but just by changing it 0 to 1 and then in a particular frequency which is an audible range of course. So, control power for external devices you can even control the power you know this in turn can connect to another relay or something which will you know operate and relay will operate and then switch will be there and you can control the power given to the another device. So, with this we have come to the end of this session ok we have discussed a lot about different kind of protocols and uh, serial port device and a uh, generic cross general purpose I So, having seen these devices and maybe having understood some high level uh, features of them. I think you you are in a better position now to look at the manuals of a particular issues that you have ok and what are the peripherals and what kind of communication happens now you will have a better idea of what is being given in those kind of manuals ok. My intent is to give you a overview, overview so that you are comfortable reading those uh, documents to know more about because these are all implemented. The all these are all implementation specific. No, I can't say that in a particular uh, register, uh, uh, no, if you change this D0 bit, no, it will start transmitting. No, it, it depends on which chip you are looking at and what implementation, which company it is from. So, it is all very implementation specific. That is why I did not go into the details of you know, uh, registers uh, and similar to what we went through in ARM instruction. So, that it is. You know very much required that you understand the philosophy and how does it operate, so that you will be able to appreciate when you come across such devices in your design uh, problems or while developing software for embedded system. So, so, hope this uh, discussion was very useful and I really enjoy sharing this information with you. Wishing you all the very best and let us see in the next session to talk about different features families and later families of ARM processors and what are the high level features that are supported in them ok. Thank you very much for your attention and support and it has been a great wonderful time sharing with you see you in the next talk. Bye bye.